Okay, we're going we're gonna to start off. Um, I'm not going to sing this morning. Be pleased to know. <laughs> Be all, all speaking. <laughs> um, so I've got the pleasure of introducing um, Tony Cohen, who's a professor of automated reasoning at the University of Leeds. He actually works about 20 miles from where I work, um, over a long period of time, in fact. And, but I first met him in um, Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, it apes. Um, so that, <laughs> and he was he was chairing the um, knowledge representation uh, conference at that time. So he's, he's the director of the Institute of AI and Biological Systems in uh, in the University of Leeds, and he's had a long and distinguished career. Um, he, he studied under Pat Hayes at uh, University of Essex. So Pat Hayes, the guy who wrote that paper, In Defense of Logic, I don't know whether you remember it from the 1970s. Um, and then he moved to the University of Warwick, and uh, now he's at the University of Leeds. So, so Tony Cohen's work is in uh, qualitative spatial, spatio-temporal reasoning, and uh, I guess uh, he's, he's most well known for the region uh, connection calculus, and in fact, I came across this while working on a paper on computer vision um, with a colleague um, a while ago and came across all his work and even has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> so so um, we're going to hear about him talk. We're going to hear um, talking today about spatial temporal reasoning and uh, I'm hopefully uh, towards the last few minutes he'll uh, give some comments on how maybe we can... Uh, apply this uh, automated planning, so that would be really cool. Okay, over to you, Tony. Okay, thanks, Lee, and thanks very much for the invitation here. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back to a real ICAPS as opposed to just to pretend AIPS sort of half day with KR. So uh, this is my first time to South America as well, so uh, lots of firsts for me here today. So, um, the, sorry, this is on the wrong slide here. So, yeah, today's talk is going to be called Building Qualitative Models from Spatial Temporal Behaviour. And it's kind of, the talk's really going to be in two parts. Um, I'm going to, I was going to be an introduction section, and then I'm going to sort of motivate sort of the general talk. And then I was particularly asked to give a kind of brief overview of quality spatial temporal reasoning. So I'm going to do that in a few slides. And then I'm going to get on to uh, the sort of the main piece of work which I want to talk about, which is uh, trying to learn quality spatial temporal models of human activity, uh, activity which we observe on video, and try to build models of events, activities, actions uh, from that. So hopefully there's some relevance there uh, to, to the planning world in terms of the kind of the representations of activities and activity um, through there. Okay, so is this not moving on? Let me just restart. Okay, so the, if, if you think about an agent moving around in the world, it needs to think about what kind of objects there are, what they can do, what they can be used for, what kind of actions and events there are, uh, which objects participate in which events, and so forth. So there's a lot of act activity um, and knowledge about the world that an agent is going to have to know about. And the question, of course, is then how an agent is going to acquire this knowledge and how it should be represented. And so I'm going to be talking uh, about both of those uh, uh, bullets there in green at the bottom of the... Um, of the page there today. So uh, it's going to be particularly about learning about events. We're going to be analysing activities in terms of event classes involving multiple objects and uh, object. I'm going to briefly talk a little bit also about having then learnt or somehow got hold of event models, how we can then actually uh, categorise objects, not by what they look like, but rather by uh, the kinds of things that they do in their interactions to other objects. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about that. 
So um, this is not a new approach, of course, it's not a new thing to do. In fact, you can go all the way back to the Machine Intelligence uh, series of books by, edited by Don Mickey, uh, Machine Intelligence 6, which is also interesting because that's, there was another paper in that, uh, in that volume which actually my PhD was based on, but that's another talk, another story, another day. Uh, but if we look at this one by um, Baron Popplestone, then uh, they had this paper called Relational Descriptions in Picture Processing, and on the right there you see a piece of ASCII art of a, of a cup, and to the bottom right you can see some, uh, in a rather slightly, slightly legible probably, but you've got the A is the inside of the cup, B is the main part of the cup, and C is the handle, and you've got various spatial relationships between the cup. And so they were really talking about how to describe the world relationally uh, back in 71. And then if you actually look at the end of that paper, it's actually got an interesting conclusion. It says, let us consider the object recognition program in its proper perspective as part of an integrated cognitive system. One of the simplest ways such a system might interact with the environment is to simply shift its viewpoint, to walk around the object. In this way, more information might be gathered and ambiguities resolved. Such activities involve planning. Okay, so here's my first link to planning. Uh, inductive generalization. Indeed, most of the capacities are acquired by an intelligent machine. So to develop a truly integrated visual system thus becomes almost coextensive with the goal of producing an integrated pop, um, cognitive system. So the point is, there's although uh, I mean, in the beginning of AI, there was sort of AI and all the subfields of AI were really kind of dealt with at the same time, and there weren't these separate communities for computer vision and machine learning and natural language and knowledge representation that we have now. But then kind of over the years, the computer vision community has very much kind of split off and gone its own separate way. Uh, and so people talk about you know, AI and computer vision as though they're two separate subjects. And I think very much still that you know, they're really um, still should be regarded as, you know, uh, as part of the same thing. I mean, there is this, uh, going back to the previous slide, you go, uh, Takeo Kanadi, uh, in the, his keynote talk in HKIO 3, made this kind of call that we try to reconnect uh, logic and vision. And if you look around, there is increasingly more work in, in, in this area, and that's sort of part of the thing we'll be doing at Leeds, but there's other people around the world trying to do that as well. So this is actually not a uh, vision produced by computer vision. This is actually produced uh, a little uh, video produced by a couple of psychologists from the psychology experiment back in 1944 by Hyde and Simmel. Uh, and they gave this to human subjects and they asked them to describe what they thought was going on in, in this um, little scenario. And as you watch it, you probably can sort of start to tell a little story. Maybe you ascribe genders to these little to get the triangles in the circle. Uh, maybe you kind of make up a story about what's happening. Um, and the, but the point is that it's only you know, a circle and a triangle, so you've got no preconceived ideas about what these things are based on their shape. If you just saw a triangle and a circle, you wouldn't have any uh, immediately preconceived idea of what, what they might do. But just by looking at the interactions between their objects, the relative spatial positions, their movements towards each other and away from each other over time, uh, and so forth, you actually can start to talk about what kind of activities are going on and, uh, as I say, tell, tell a story which is going to have a, a dramatic denouement any moment now. <laughs> okay, so he gets his girl, and uh, this guy's rather frustrated. Okay. <laughs> so the point is, as I say, is that um, what's important often, often is not what objects look like, but rather what they do in their interactions with other objects. So this leads me on now to talk about uh, the quality of spatial temporal representations. I'm going to spend a few slides talking about that. So of course these aren't the replacement for metric representations, they're very complementary. But if we think about the way human beings describe the world, it tends very much to be qualitative. When I talk about coming through the door, you're sitting on the chairs, I'm standing at the front of the room, I'm facing you, um, the computer's between me and the um, video camera at the end. Between was mentioned in the invited talk yesterday as a kind of interesting spatial relationship. Uh, and that's at least one of the ones that you can find in the QSR literature. And so if we're interested in doing machine learning, then it's kind of good because it naturally provides abstraction uh, and how tries to uh, get away from irrelevant detail so that one you know, invited talk is good. The actual um, special interaction between me and the audience will be slightly different to the ones yesterday, but in general, it's the same kind of setup, the same kind of spatial relationships between me and the audience uh, and the computer. And every so often, I go across here and touch the uh, keyboard again to move on to the next slide. And of course, there's lots of applications in geography, computer vision, which will be the main subject of today's talk, also robotics, natural language, 
uh, processing biology. And there's lots and lots of calculi uh, out there. Uh, so mostly, most of these calculi, actually what they do is they try to just, uh, develop sets of jointly exhaustive and pairwise disjoint relationships. That is, it's a set of relationships, usually a kind of fairly small set. Um, Lee already mentioned the RCC calculus, which we'll come on to in a moment, which has got uh, in various forms, by either 3 or 5 or 8 or 22, but a relatively small number. Uh, there's temporal calculi, which has three of these. Uh, spatial, there's actually hundreds of these things out there by now. Uh, spatial temporal calculi, I haven't actually counted, but there's a, some small number. Uh, somewhere between the temporal and the spatial ones, probably. So, um, in a, one of these calculi, there's exactly one relationship uh, that will hold between any two objects at any one time, and there will always be exactly uh, one relationship. So, they cover the possibilities, and only one will be possible. So let's look at temporal quality spatial temp quality temporal calculi to begin with. I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, particularly within the Fanning community here, with uh, things like Allen's interval algebra, uh, Villankaus's point algebra. Uh, you see the interval algebra here, which we're coming back to uh, later on in the talk. So we've got between two one-piece intervals, we've got uh, six possible relationships, which the first one could be with respect to the second. It could be before it, could meet it, overlap. They could both start at the same time. The first one could be during it, or they could be finished at the same time. Those are all asymmetric, so we can get uh, the inverses as well, and then the equality case, so that gets us 6 times 2 plus 1 is 13. And then you can make that more expressive, you can add durations to it, uh, and that, so basically that's like a cross product between the IA and the PA, uh, so then we can talk about whether one duration of one interval is smaller or equal to the other one. Of course, if one interval is part of the other one, so starts during finishes, then obviously it has to be a part of, so that means that's why you don't get the full 3 times 13 possibilities, you actually get 25. So, uh, but as we say, move to the spatial case, and you really get many, many more possible calculi. And this really divides the, the, the multidimensionality of space as opposed to just the one dimensionality of time. Of course, you, what you can do is you could just try to apply uh, the Allen interval calculus in two dimensions. So you can take two uh, regions, project them to the x axis, to the y axis, and that kind of works reasonably well. Uh, and uh, you can sort of do that, project it, and in the first case it works quite well, so the orange object is going to be before the uh, green object on the y-axis and after it on the green axis, but obviously in the bottom case here, the uh, orange object is during the uh, green object in both the x and y axis, but in fact they're disconnected, so maybe that's, that doesn't work quite so well. But if the objects are rectangular and nicely aligned to the, uh, to the axis, then this actually works quite well, uh, and it's been widely used. Um, and indeed, also I've just done some recent work with Jochen Rents, which is in KR12 this year, where we kind of develop this and ask, also add on the idea of ranking intervals, so that you can say uh, not only uh, do you have um, the Allen interval algebra and the durations of them in the Indu, Indu, in the Indu calculus, but you also uh, can say that uh, the, uh, you can actually give an absolute ranking order to, the, uh, to all the lengths of all the intervals uh, projected to the x and y axes. So there's, again, another reason why we get so many different calculi. Of course, there's many different aspects. We can talk about the ontology. I'll talk about each of these things over the next slides. Lots of different kinds of relations. You can have topological relationships, orientation, distance, and so forth. Um, the different reasoning mechanisms you could have. Uh, most of these calculi are for what I call pure space, but you could also think about uh, domain dependent space if you think about, uh, it depends on whether objects are actually physical objects, if they're physical objects they can't interpenetrate, but if you've got geographical objects then they can, so for example uh, Scandinavia overlaps the European Union uh, because not all countries in Scandinavia are right, actually part of the uh, European Union, but you wouldn't get that kind of situation happening, that interpenetration with physical objects. So if you think about the ontology of your of space, you need to think about what kind of things you want to allow as your spatial entity. So you're going to be thinking about points or lines, uh, boundaries, regions, two-dimensional regions, three-dimensional regions, four-dimensional regions, including time. Are they open, closed? Do you want to have regular or non-regular? Do you want to have multi-piece regions, so Greece and all its islands? Um, a, 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 a glass, and it, it, you then drop it on the, on the floor, it becomes broken into several pieces. Uh, 
what's the embedding space, uh, are you now going to have two dimensional regions within three dimensional space, and so forth. So there's a, big, a lot of questions there you need to decide on before you start building your calculus as to, as to what kind of spatial entities you want to have, what the dimensions are, and so forth. And again, that kind of accounts for some of the wide variety of calculi we see out there. So, um, Leo already mentioned the region connection calculus in his introduction, so again, many of you maybe f have heard of this before. Uh, so you see on the top right there a depiction of the uh, eight uh, joint exhaustive and pairwise disjoint relationships. So they can be disconnected, uh, touching, partially overlapping, uh, tangential proper part or non-tangential proper, proper part, and these inverses and equality uh, there in the middle. Uh, we'll come back to what the arrows mean a little bit later on. And I can see there's one arrow missing from the equality to the top right there, but we assume that's there. Uh, so these that you can actually define all those relationships from a single primitive of X is connected to Y, meaning roughly they share a point or their closure share a point. Uh, but there's an alter another alternative way of building up that calculus, which was done in the GIS literature by Egenhoff and his colleagues. And there we usually take the boundary of an object, the interior and exterior, and just consider the kind of quality of the idea of whether the, the, uh, those sets are empty or non-empty. And if you do that, there's two to the nine, five, twelve possible combinations. But if you make various assumptions like the regular plane point sets, you get back to essentially the same set of eight relationships up there on the top right. But it's potentially more expressive because you can actually easily then have uh, multiple uh, dimension things. So, for example, you can uh, have uh, the, because of the relation, quality of relationships between a line uh, and a region. So this might be a road uh, you know, to go bus, uh, through or alongside the park. So you, so you get uh, all these kinds of relationships as well. Uh, you can consider those direction calculus. Again, there's lots and lots and lots of these. I just put up one uh, kind of almost at random. This is the opera calculus by, uh, which comes from the University of Bremen. So here we consider oriented points. You've got an oriented point A, which has sort of got its direction uh, going straight up the slide here, and B, which has got its oriented direction going to the, the, the top left. And then we, we divide each of these. In, it depends on you can have different granularity, but here we've kind of got a basic granularity of... Um, of uh, four lines through it, uh, and so we then label alternatively the lines and the intervals between the lines. Zero, one is, the, is basically northeast, uh, sort of north northeast, and then two is northeast, and then three is the interval between that and so forth. So then we can say that B is in direction 13 from A, and A is in direction three from B, and so we get this kind of uh, calculus in that way. Uh, you can also have region-based calculi, so um, uh, one obvious thing to choose there would be to use the uh, rectangle algebra, which is the cross product of the Allen's interval algebra. And so then the left-hand side, we can say that A is basically, you want to say it's sort of northeast of, uh, of B, and we do that by saying it's, uh, it's um, A is greater than, um, uh, that's not way really around, it, it uh, should be, uh, should be less than, so A should be less than B on the x-axis and it meets B uh, on, or it's met by B on, on, on the y-axis. And on the uh, other one, we can actually do interior directions as well. Uh, so we can say that C finishes uh, D on the x-axis and it's during D on, on the y-axis. Uh, and you can obviously not, just not use the rectangle algebra, you could use the Indo calculus. Uh, you can say things there from Ireland is the west of England, a smaller than England. You could also talk about quality, uh, sort of introduce movement. Now, all the calculi I've talked about so far have been static calculi, just depicting a single situation at a single time. Uh, you've got a particular series of calculi, of which I just put up the simplest version of it here, called the quality trajectory calculus, which comes from uh, Nikhil van der Weeg and his colleagues at the University of Ghent. And so here, basically, what you do is consider two objects, and whether they're moving towards each other, so the quality of the idea there, or away from each other, whether they're stationary with respect to each other at any point in time. But you kind of got this notion of motion, uh, and so you. So here, if you just consider ignoring relative speed, uh, you can have, obviously have two objects uh, going away from each other on the top left. So that would be uh, plus plus, or um, and then you've got this. Um, then the next next one down here is. Um, here we've got uh, this one stationary, and this one's moving away from it. Here now this one's stationary, the other one's moving it away from here. They're both stationary. 
here, this one's pursuing this one. Uh, here, they're approaching this one and this one's station and vice versa. And here, they're basically attracting each other. So the, uh, it will be minus minus in this notation. So again, you can, there are various different other versions of this, sort of two dimensions, three dimensions. Um, but, uh, and again, this is a very small uh, set of possible calculi out of the hundreds out there in the literature, but hoping it gives you the kind of idea of the kind of distinctions, the kind of calculi that these things look like. Now, all of these then, people have developed uh, qualitative, um, well, developed reasoning mechanisms, and the typical thing to do is basically because if you look at the full first order uh, theories, they tend to be undecidable. So you look at constraint languages, like the constraint language of RCC8. So you just take those eight relationships as primitive. And then you start building composition reasoning, composition-based reasoning, where you think, well, what's the, if you have know the relationship between A and B, and the relationship R2 between B and C, then what's the relationship between A and C? So here, A is a non-tangential part of B, and C is a uh, non-tangential proper part of A, then what's the relationship between A and C? Well, A is a non-tangential proper part of C. Um, but uh, in, in general, you might get the disjunction, and this is a very typical for qualitative reasoning. So if you have that uh, the, region here, the region here is a tangent, tangential proper part of the uh, pink and purple region and here depending on whether it's uh, um, it, so here it's also tangential proper part but tending, depending where it is it's either going to be an, uh, a, non a tangential or a non-tangential proper part of the outer region um, and so you can then pre-compute these composition tables uh, people have looked a lot at the, co uh, the tractability of determining consistency using these composition tables. Uh, under certain circumstances, they will de determine consistency for you. Um, and so people then have looked at trying to compute the maximal uh, tractable subsets, uh, which will make this operation of finding, uh, detecting whether a set of relationships are consistent or not uh, uh, more efficient. And there's an automatic procedure being developed by Jochen Rentz, which will actually do this for kind of a fairly wide set of uh, arbitrary calculi. So you don't actually have to compute those maximal tractable subsets manually. There's also, I just thought I mentioned something funny. Uh, there's there's um, some work being done by um, Frank Dalton and Michael Zachariashev which then combines uh, temporal logic with RCC, uh, booted operations and regions. So you then get this decidable logic, which is actually piece space complete. You've got temporal operators like since and until, and you could define next, always in the future, sometime in the future. And that gives you the ability to say things like, for example, Kosovo will not always be part of Yugoslavia, and just in blue above it, you've got the modal logic formula for that. Or only Germany will use the euro forever. Who knows whether that's going to be true or not. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the UK will still be composed of Great Britain plus Northern Ireland. So this is kind of quite expressive. You can have, uh, you can see here, you've got uh, temporal operators here inside uh, an RCC relationship. Here you've got a composition of um, temporal operators with, with the, uh, the temporal operators outside. Uh, here we've got Boolean operations inside uh, the, the, the RCC relationship. So this is kind of pretty, pretty um, expressive but still remains decidable, uh, and in fact, piece space complete. I said I'd say what those arrows meant just earlier. So this basically, these arrows tell you uh, what the next possible relationship would be, assuming continuous movement, continuous transition, continuous deformation of, of the regions. So if you start at the left-hand side, uh, here with disconnected, uh, you then have uh, these two pieces disconnected, and if you think about these things moving, I've actually got a slight gap there, but they're supposed to be touching, uh, the next possible relationship would be they'd be externally connected and then they partially overlap and then depending on how they move in the relative size it may might either be a tangential and proper part this way or the inverse or they might become equal and so forth but you can't get from non-tangential proper part to partial overlap without going through either um, tangential proper part or, uh, or equal so this kind of tells you kind of what could happen next. It gives you a basis for thinking about what's going to happen over time. You could build a qualitative simulation algorithm to do this. I did some work on this a while ago, where we then sort of simulated the amoeba eating a, a piece of uh, a piece of food or the operation of a force pump. Uh, it's interesting to notice if you have uh, 
uh, as precise as um, as the, um, if you're not quite sure of uh, exactly which relationship holds, you t uh, and if you're uncertain, what you do find is the uncertainty manifests itself as a connected subgraph. So you're not going to be uncertain uh, in that it's either EQ or, 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 um, or um, disconnected. It, you know, are these things actually touching or not? So you take, might get an uncertainty which represent, manifests itself as the disjunction of these two relationships. Okay, that was my very brief tour of QSR. I kind of now want to move back to thinking about using QSR, looking at uh, videos, and trying to understand and build models of our activity. So there is a problem at this point. Is there anybody who's ever worked in computer vision knows uh, computer vision, although people have been working on it over the last 40, 50 years, and huge amounts of progress have been made, it's still an imperfect science. Uh, you don't always detect the objects. You can't always track them uh, smoothly. Uh, and so there's, this, what, there's a real problem then in actually trying to get uh, a smooth sequence of qualitative relationships. Uh, of course, we'd like to have a nice smooth uh, sequence because that's going to make, what if we have a nice smooth sequence for what, one particular activity, like uh, bouncing a ball here and then chasing it, uh, and then it happens again, we'd like some of them to be as similar as possible. And if we get lots of noise introduced by the transition from the quantitative, the vision, to the uh, qualitative relationship, then these things will actually too look uh, very different. So what we can do is we can use a hidden Markov model to actually smooth the relationships. We train it up uh, on, on some uh, scenarios where we actually say that these are actually uh, good transitions. These are um, the cases where a particular relationship holds. There's another situation where a particular relationship holds. We can build a temporal model then for how one transition, um, how one relationship will transition to another one over time. And uh, here, then you can see, we're going to have two lines. Uh, we're showing the, these uh, R68 relationships evolving uh, between the ball and the person. The top line is I've labeled PSI, which is point set intersection. So that's kind of the raw version. If you just intersect the, the, the rectangles, uh, which the vision system gives us for the uh, bounding boxes uh, of the uh, ball and the person. And the bottom is going to be the one we get after smoothing using uh, an HMM, which has been trained. Play. There we go. Uh, so you can see in the top line, we've got many more, many more transitions. The bottom line, uh, we've got a much smoother set of transitions, which uh, model uh, the kind of real, um, what a human would then see uh, as the translation, um, as the relationships between these two objects. And so by using this, it kind of gives us a much better, uh, a much smoother, much more uh, kind of clean representation of what's going on, which is going to be much better to use uh, when we then start trying to learn and build activity models. You don't actually have to uh, pre-specify your relationships. I've talked about all these hundreds of calculi out there. You could actually try to learn, a, 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 a learn your own set of discretized uh, relationships. And we did this in earlier work where we were looking at traffic models and we were looking at uh, things like you know, cars following, overtaking each other and so forth. And there we, we uh, automatically learned a set of relationships, which kind of, if you looked at the relationships learned, were things like behind and following to the side, uh, going uh, overtaking and so forth. Here, this is in an EU project called Cognito, where we're sort of uh, trying to learn workflow activities for people uh, either building something or repairing some kind of uh, objects in a factory. Uh, this is just a very simple scenario where we're just trying to uh, build something with a piece of wood and some pegs and so forth. Uh, and what we do is we model between each pair of objects uh, the, the, the relative uh, distance between the two objects and their relative speed. Either are they moving towards each other uh, or away from each other and the, sp the relative speeds they're doing that. Uh, and having done that, uh, we can then quantize it. Uh, so on the left you see just the raw um, distances uh, uh, show me for each pair of objects on the right you see them colored and that's after having then um, clustered the, the different um, metric relationships we get across all, all the training data uh, in, into set of clusters so we then build ourselves a set of JPD relationships and of course the question is how many uh, how fine grained you want that representation to be I mean here's the situation you get for two, dis two states, six states, up to 16 states, you can actually decide which one you want using a Bayesian information criterion. 
Uh, so based on the y-axis we've got uh, speed, along the x-axis we've got distance, and so going further to the right means that the objects are further apart, uh, going up means they are uh, moving away from each other, uh, going down the... So this is, this is zero, so this means going further uh, away from each other, this means getting closer to each other, and this means uh, they're further apart. So this uh, region here, this is the relationship of we're fairly close to each other, and the, the purple ones fairly close to each other, and uh, moving closer. Okay. So now I want to move on to actually how we represent activity and relationships, uh, uh, um, so representing activities qualitatively using relations. So think about a very simple interaction here. You've just got two regions. Uh, the white region starts off inside or being a tangential, non-tangential part of the, um, the gray one. Uh, and then it eventually moves out. So we're actually just going to model this with using three relationships, part of, uh, overlapping, and discrete. And basically, there's kind of three uh, different intervals that are of interest here. There's the first interval where the first object is part of it. There's another region uh, interval where it's partially overlaps. And the final one where it's discrete. And we could also, of course, think about the Allen relationships between those three intervals. So the green one meets the blue one, the blue one meets the red one, and the green one's before the red one. And of course, we could represent that just using some kind of uh, standard logic, text-based logic representation, maybe using a holes predicate. So that, so that um, during interval I1, uh, x is part of y, and so forth. And we can specify the, um, the, the relationships between the, um, the intervals as well. But the, the, for most of the work we've been doing, uh, we actually prefer to use this kind of graphical representation here, where we have three layers in, in our graph. At the bottom layer, we have uh, the objects. Uh, which is just only we have one occurrence for any particular object and multiple arcs going out of it to level two nodes which are basically episodes during which some spatial relationship holds these are maximal intervals during which particular spatial relationship holds and at layer three we then have the allen telper relationships holding between those three um, uh, episodes and so these, this is entirely equivalent if you like to the textual representation at the top but as we'll see in a moment, uh, that we can actually do some interesting graph-based operations in terms of comparisons between graphs, and it kind of gives us a much more compact way of talking about uh, these kinds of relationships and these kinds of situations. So you can then go on to represent a hot entire uh, video relationship. This is just kind of quite a short one, but just to give you an idea of what it kind of looked like. So here we're actually representing three different kinds of quality spatial relationship. For the, one the QTC at the top uh, bar going across there is these quality direct relationships that so depart away, static, and so forth. The middle one are direction relationships, upper right, upper left, down left, and so forth. And the bottom row evolving there, P, PO, is topological relationships, part, partially overlap, discrete, and so forth. Uh, and so you can see there's just two objects at the bottom, and then we get an increasing number of spatial uh, relationships as we the different episodes evolve, and then we get the uh, temporal relationships at the top. We have various ways of simplifying this graph to drop um, nodes which can, can be deemed irrelevant or are less useful uh, for one reason or another, which I don't have time to go into here. Okay, so as I say, we've been working on this kind of work, this kind of approach of trying to build models of video activity using this kind of qualitative high-level spatial temporal approach uh, over a number of years. I'm certainly not going to have time to cover all of that. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, some of that work, particularly uh, the work uh, at AAAI uh, 10, where we need to do unsupervised event learning, uh, which I think is a particularly interesting challenge, in particularly in the case where you have multiple activities going on simultaneously, and you, there's a real challenge to figure out what is actually going on and how many different activities are going on simultaneously. And I'll talk about that. If I've got time, I'll talk a little bit about a, a semi-supervised approach um, uh, before I finish. So um, what we want to do, as I've already said, we want to, we want to point a camera with, uh, at a scene with complex activities, like an aircraft domain. Here's some aircraft being serviced. This is a part of an EU project which just finished last year called CoFriend at Toulouse Airport. This is Gate 40. And we had seven cameras around the gate, 
uh, and we then try to build models automatically of the different kinds of uh, activities such as loading, unloading and so forth that were going on there. It might be a kitchen activity or maybe a football uh, game such as some of you watched last night. So um, we want to think about how we're going to look, view the world. So we're thinking about activities consisting of different events. And we think of events as being goal-directed act interactions between the subset of objects. Um, events are going to be patterned. So we want to think of each event, each distinct event class is characterized by some kind of pattern. There might be multiple patterns. There might be several different ways of making a cup of coffee with sugar, without sugar. Maybe you put in the milk first or the coffee first. But it's kind of they all involve a cup uh, and stuff being put into it. And so we want to sort of have, have model all of those uh, in the same activity class, in the same event class. But there may be, uh, you may have lots of problems with noise coming from the, um, from, from the vision, which may not be perfect. And also the fact that you may get sort of coincidental interactions. So if we just go back to that uh, aircraft domain a moment ago, as I mean, you've got the different kind of vehicles involved here, you've got the refueling vehicle, you've got the uh, unloading vehicle, you've kind of got the conveyor belt vehicles and so forth, and the kind of luggage trolley vehicles. It may be unloading is going on, and during the part of the um, scene that the unloading is going on, you've got the, the, the unloading vehicles and the, um, the, the conveyor belt and so forth there and the plane, but the fuel truck might drive past. But as it happens, this time it drives past, another time it goes a completely different route, it doesn't go anywhere close. So that's the kind of coincidence, just coincidental. The fuel truck just happened to drive past where the, um, where the unloading was taking place. And so we want to regard, uh, kind of ignore those coincidences uh, and, and not say, well, actually, you know, unloading really involves the fuel truck driving past as well, or at least sometimes it does. So, so there's that kind of uh, problem which which complicates the task of learning. And so the, the, this, what I'll talk about at the moment, this, this first part of this uh, learning start of part of the talk, is how we can learn events where we've got, you know, this, the, the plane is being simultaneously unloaded, refueled, um, recatered, uh, and so forth, all at the same time, uh, but not necessarily the, exactly the same way it, 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 in every single turnaround. These things actually may happen in different orders and different turnarounds. Uh, and despite the presence of noise and coincidences. So we think of each event as being a set of spatial temporal histories featuring the objects involved, the plane, the refueler, the unloader, and so forth. Uh, each, each event is going to compose of some particular set of objects, not necessarily all the objects on the scene, a subset of objects on the scene. Each event, each actual event is unique, but I think uh, we want to then abstract away from each individual event to notions of event class where there may be some variation in how the event class is performed amongst the different instances of that event, but uh, that they will still have similar description. Of course, just by using a quality spatial temporal relationships, we've already abstracted a lot from uh, a lot of the sort of individual variation that may go on. But there could still be different orders of things happening, you know, whether you put in the coffee into the mug first or the milk first. And in general, we're going to think about event classes as being event classes because there are many different instances of those events. So I just want to mention briefly this idea of interactivity. So this is, if you like, a focus mechanism, an attention mechanism for trying to decide which objects are involved in which events and how many objects are involved in any particular uh, event. So I've kind of got three sort of prototypical situations here. At the top, we've got three objects, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, which kind of evolve over time and you've got all snapshots of how they relate to each other over time. So initially, they were all disconnected, and then one touches two, and then three touches two, and then uh, one, two, and three all mutually touch each other, and then three separates off, and then two separates off, and then three touches one. And then if I plot along these, these lines here, uh, these lines here, which then tell me uh, when there's a spatial change, there's a change of spatial relationship between the different objects involved. So here, at this point here, there's a change in spatial relationship between tau 1 and tau 2, and uh, there's another change here, and here's the change between tau 2 and tau 3, and between tau 1 and tau 3. And you see that what happens here is that it's exactly two spatial changes between each pair of objects, and they're kind of nicely distributed over time. Compare that, we'll say, the bottom situation now, where again there's two sets of spatial changes between each of the objects, but basically the, initially what's happening is the interactions between 7 and 8, and then between 8 and 9, and then between 9 and 7. So maybe that looks rather more like three separate events happening one after the other, rather than um, a combined event. 
the middle one is kind of a situation where actually number six really looks rather like a bystander because it only doesn't have any spatial changes at all with four and there's only two between five and six but all the action seems to be happening between four and five so maybe six isn't really part of this event at all uh, and it's really just an event involving four and five so this kind of says that uh, if we're thinking about just a single event, maybe the top one is, is, is the best, where we have three objects. Um, the, 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 the bottom one maybe is three separate events, and maybe the middle one is actually just a single event, but involving uh, two objects rather than three. That, and that maybe that all three of them are, are still it's not a kind of uh, a Boolean decision. We can have degrees of interactivity, and so we can actually score these uh, things, and we've got a way of scoring these different situations to how interactive they are. But this kind of gives, then gives us a way of uh, trying to decide when we have lots of activity happening simultaneously, which objects involved in which activities. So the summary of this, the way we do event, unsupervised event learning, which I don't have time to go into too much detail here today, uh, basically well, the way we characterize any particular event class is non parametrically. So we have these event graphs, which I showed you earlier. Each event class are then characterized by a set of event graphs which kind of characterize the characteristic ways of performing that particular action. So, you know, putting the milk in first, putting the coffee in first, with no sugar, with, uh, with sugar, and so forth. So there'll be maybe, you know, four or five different ways of making coffee, and each of those will have a kind of characteristic event graph. Maybe some of them will involve two objects, just the milk and the coffee, and maybe just the coffee and the, uh, well, and the cup, and others one might involve sugar as well. So you could have a very number of objects. But essentially, you characterize each of these, each event by a set of these event graphs. And then the task is try to explain data, the, the video that we see, which has been abstracted to this big uh, activity graph involving all these quality spatial relationships at these three different levels of the graph. Um, so we will define a way of dividing the tracks so they can be divided into sets of tracklets, each of which obeys the spatial temporal constraints of some event class. But of course, we don't know a priori what the event classes are. So it's not like this is not supervised learning. We have to figure out both how many event classes there are, uh, what, the, what the typical, event what the typical uh, graphs are for each event class, and uh, how many objects involved, and so forth. So basically, it's a kind of a problem of uh, finding a maximally probable interpretation in terms of the number of event classes and the event graphs for each of those event classes, such that uh, and it, it's, it's the most probable one in the sense that it explains as much as possible. So ideally, we've got the, the whole video, we extract it all to this big event graph uh, with all these different spatial relationships and temporal relationships, and we'd like to explain as much as possible of that huge graph in terms of being instances of different event classes. But there might be some bits which is better left unexplained because we, uh, there's really just coincidences. We'd like to minimize the number of event classes because otherwise we could just say that each single bit of that uh, activity go off is just a separate event, a separate event class, and we wouldn't really get any power of abstraction there. So we want to make things uh, minimize the number of event classes. But of course, we could do that just by saying there's one event class, which is basically stuff happens, uh, but then actually it would, it would really be um, very disparate the event graphs within that particular event class wouldn't look at all similar. So we kind of got this tension between minimizing the event classes but having event classes such that the graphs are kind of pretty similar within the event class. And we can compute a measure of uh, a graph similarity uh, using this uh, bag of graph that's representation. So we have, uh, if we've got a particular prototype graph for a particular event class, a particular way of doing a particular event, we can then look at all the subgraphs or a subset of the subgraphs of that, I take another event graph, and we can look to see the similarity in terms of numbers of events of shared subgraphs. We actually, what we do is compute a histogram of, the, uh, of a library of um, subgraphs in the first event graph and in the second one, and then we compute a, a distance uh, in high dimensional space between them. And we're also going to want to have events where we've got a high degree of uh, track interaction uh, in the sense that I had on the previous slide. We also, we, there's a question about whether events actually uh, may share objects or not. So if we think about the aircraft scenario, clearly the plane is going to be involved in probably well, pretty well all the events. So that's often going to be a shared object, which is, is participating simultaneously, being unloaded and refueled and so forth. Whilst uh, 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 the other uh, objects like the, the refueling truck will only be involved in the refueling operation. 
So typically, we would want to forbid object sharing, where we kind of generally view something that makes two events different as the fact that they actually have different objects involved. And the way we then try to find this maximally probable interpretation is basically by an MCMC search, uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain search, and we've got a number of different kind of moves we can have, such as um, you know, basically what we're trying to do is to split up uh, the tracks. You know, where do we split the tracks into tracks that so that we say that the first part of the operation of this uh, life of this this object is involved in that event, and the second part of the history of this object is involved in some other event. Uh, and we can merge or split region histories. We can actually even change the spatial relationships uh, if we want to, uh, if we think that gives us a better overall uh, interpretation for the video. And so we do this big search, and it typically converges in about a thousand uh, cycles. Uh, and then we then evaluated this in the aircraft domain, uh, 24 aircraft turnarounds, 37 hours of video. There's a lot of data there, a lot of... Um, a, a lot of um, stuff to learn from and check. This is all done in this particular case with a single viewpoint. Uh, we did semi-automated tracking of the plane. Uh, we actually discarded the class labels for the purpose of, of doing this so we wouldn't be unduly influenced by the class labels. We then used uh, a simplified version of uh, RCC5, RCC, which has just had these three relationships, part, partial overlap, and discrete. And the system automatically then discovered essentially two main classes given the data we gave it, one which is kind of loading and unloading, it couldn't tell the difference because this vision system wasn't able to track the luggage going up and down the conveyor belts. Uh, and the other one which is basically a combined class of the bridge going on and off and the plane puller going on at the end. And for this single view, we didn't see uh, some of the other operations like caging which happened on, on the other side of the aircraft. So this kind of worked uh, fairly well. Um, I want to just briefly now go on about this work uh, on learning object classes uh, from behavior rather than their appearance. That most computer vision work has actually concentrated on trying to learn uh, object categories and object classes from, uh, from what they look like. But given that we now have a model of activity, we can actually think about, well, can we actually try to categorize objects by what they do, how they interact with other objects, rather than what they look like? And there's, that's kind of a reasonably uh, simple way of trying to do that. Basically, what you can do is you have all these different event classes, so those form the columns here. You've got all the objects which form the rows. And basically, we look at each event, cl each event class has got a number of different arguments. So uh, something like refueling involves the aircraft and the refueling truck, so there's just two objects involved there. And you can then look to see, uh, for each instance, you look, if, uh, you look to see, you put a one in this, in this matrix if, um, if, if uh, for all the different objects that occur in, in argument position one of event one, uh, and then all the put another row, another column will be all the all the um, objects which appear in uh, posi argument position two, and another row, another column will all the objects which appear in argument position three. Uh, if you then compress these rows using PCA, you can then get a um, object taxonomy. So that here's one which we did kind of using a toy kitchen, and you can see it's nice and clutched clusters of the food off to the left the kind of pots and pans in another part of the hierarchy, then the utensils, the plates, and so forth, the hands in another part, and even the visual noise in another part, with some nice, actually nice sort of sub-hierarchies. Um, so it's separated the toast from the vegetables, but that's still in a different part of the hierarchy too. And this is all done com completely just by analyzing activity, not by looking at the object uh, uh, appearance at all. And in the aircraft domain, Again, here's just a, a sort of a visual uh, a analysis of going on. You can see that it's got it pretty good. Uh, so, for example, looking over here, uh, these is all recognize the aircraft. It's all, all except for this one instance here. Uh, th these ones here are pretty well all the conveyor belts. Uh, these here are pretty well all, all the, um, the, the towing trucks. Okay, let me briefly uh, just talk about uh, the semi-supervised approach to uh, event learning. So here, instead of trying to do unsupervised, we want to try, I'm going to give some supervision. We want to try to minimize the supervision. And so the approach we've taken is just say, uh, just rather than exactly which objects involves event uh, class, just by roughly delineating where the object and where the particular event is happening. So it's kind of like pointing over there, there's the refueling. Over there, there's the uh, unloading and so forth. So basically, what you do, delineating a space-time cuboid, uh, 
uh, and then we uh, then have got a uh, transactional typed inductive logic programming system, which then induces rules uh, from that kind of data. So just a brief uh, review of inductive logic programming. Uh, so the hypothesis space here is a set of all logic programs. Um, each rule is going to be of the form of the event is implied by some sort of conditions. It gives us a very expressive language for learning uh, event models. And we want to find a set of rules such that all, or at least most of the examples are correctly labeled by those rules. And we've been able to be able to use, to use types to improve efficiency and also reduce overgeneralization from noisy examples. The vision system doesn't always give us the correct uh, object type classification. And by having a high type hierarchy, we can actually mitigate against some of the problems caused by the vision system. So again, in this particular work, we then use 15 aircraft turnarounds. You can see there's a lot of data, 50,000 frames for each turnaround. In this particular case, we're using a different vision system by one of my partners in the project, where they then combined the views from six different cameras onto a ground plane using homographies and then a fusion operation. And we're getting about uh, 350 spatial uh, facts for each, um, for each turnaround plus temporal information. There were 10 different event classes uh, between 3 and 15 examples for each. Lots and lots of noise in the original data, false missing displaced objects, broken switch tracks and so forth. Um, and so it really was, was quite a challenging problem. Um, this is a typical example of one of the rules learnt. So this is the, just, uh, I just put this up because this is one of the simplest ones, so it's easiest to see. This is aircraft arrival. In this particular work, we assume the presence of uh, pre-assigned zones on the, on the tarmac. This, the aircraft domain is nice because you know, there's a fixed place where the aircraft comes in. It's marked on the tarmac. So you've got different zones like where the aircraft has to park, where the um, bulk, the aft bulk TS zone uh, is and these different other zones where stuff activity has to happen and we can then look we can then build models in terms of whether the object uh, is in uh, or touches uh, a particular zone and so this says that aircraft arrival is if the uh, the aircraft is in uh, one particular zone and the aircraft touches uh, uh, another zone the same zone at a different time and those two intervals meet and there's a kind of de pictorial uh, depiction of that rule at the bottom. So here's, a, here's this video, which I won't have time to play the whole thing, but this is just showing you those uh, rules being recognized. Uh, so it, it, if you get the sort of green circle around it, it means it's correctly using those automatically learned rules, uh, learned the particular um, activity. So this is GPU positioning before the aircraft arrives. They always, the ground power unit always has to be in, in place. So that's been correctly uh, recognized. At the top left, we can actually see the, the prologue rule, which has been automatically learned uh, from, uh, from the data. That's not the right aircraft. I'll just play this along until the correct aircraft comes into the scene. See, so there's lots of other stuff happening uh, going on in here. This is obviously speeded up, but it's not recognizing any of the activities actually being part of um, the kind of the, 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 the learned event classes. So here's the aircraft arrival and there's the bridge positioning. So the first three events, it's all a recognized find from the automatically learned rules. Um, it was actually interesting to compare this against uh, handcrafted rules. You might think, well, why don't you just use handcrafted rules? It actually turns out the learned rules are better, and that's precisely because of this problem of noise. The handcrafted rules, you kind of, people tend to write them assuming ideal data, but, uh, but it turns out that actually the data isn't ideal, there's all this visual noise, uh, the noise that results in the computer vision system. And so, because they're trying to look for the, the perfect situation, it never actually happens, and so the rules often fa fail to fire. But because we've learned rules in the presence of noise, they're actually able to work much better. So the blue numbers for the, the two columns here are showing where the learned rules do better than the handcrafted rules, which you can see is almost all the time across uh, these one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, ten different development classes. Right, just about on time here. So, uh, perfectly timed. Summary, uh, novelty. Just, uh, there's lots and lots of quality khaki. I only have time just to do a very brief tour through them. Uh, the whole idea of what we've been trying to do at Leeds is then trying to go from pixels all the way up to symbolic, relational, quality behavioral event descriptions with minimal supervision, but really, with really challenging scenarios where you've got multiple objects, shared objects, simultaneous events. Uh, we've got a way of computing these quality relationships robustly via this hidden Markov model. And I briefly talked about how to functionally categorize objects uh, by what they do rather than what they look like. Ongoing work, uh, we'll, 
and you use longer scenes. I talked briefly about the cognitive project where we're trying to learn workflow. There's another project uh, which is actually not on the slide, I guess it should be, which is joint with uh, Federico uh, Pecora, which who talked last night at the Festivus, which is where we're looking at this, find this kind of work in, in a robotic domain, in a kind of scenario there's a restaurant, uh, where there's an ongoing DARPA Mind's Eye project where we're learning especially temporal semantics of, of verbs from video data. We're experimenting with different sets of spatial relationships. Uh, having actually induced the functional categories, you can then use that to supervise appearance learning if you want to. Uh, we've uh, done some experiments on that. We've also used it using uh, learning probabilistic weights. So we've shown that by using a Markov logic network, we can actually improve the performance of the ILP system. We've also shown how you can interleave induction and abduction again to mitigate noise. So basically what happens, it, the trouble is you tend to overfit uh, rules uh, if you've got noise. So what you can then do is you try to explain away some of the noisy in instances using abduction, so you then don't have to cover those noisy instances uh, using your learning system. And we've also looked at trying to learn a global model. So if you think about the aircraft domain, there's a kind of rough sequence of things happening. The GP arrives, the aircraft arrives, at the end, the, the, um, the aircraft leaves. But kind of in between, there's the temporal order is it's sort of semi-fixed, but it's not completely fixed. So you want to have a sort of probabilistic model of the order in which these things can happen. Okay, that's it. Any questions? And thanks to my various colleagues, particularly David Hock, my co-investigator, and the various students and research fellows there. Thanks. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Enjoyed that a lot. I, I was just wondering whether you could get any additional information about the uh, perhaps the relevance of particular objects in the scene by by doing a sort of vector algebra over the the objects to see what paths they're following and whether they're likely to intersect at some point in time or whether they're following trajectories that are completely separated from the trajectories that the other objects appear to be following sort of build in a little bit of that more quantitative type of information into the qualitative picture. And I completely agree. I mean, I did say at some point that I, mean, I view qualitative information as a kind of, as a um, complement to quantitative rather than replacement. In the Mind's Eye project, we are indeed using I mean, sort of, um, so, so some, some much lower level features, sort of things like action, such as a kick or bend, which you kind of learned and, and recognize completely by kind of quantitative uh, stiff feature analysis. Um, uh, as well as the kind of the, the more high level uh, relationships. Uh, in the aircraft domain uh, project, we didn't actually do it with one of the partners in our project at Inria and um, Sophie Antipolis, did, some, did do some work on trajectory analysis and then learning uh, the typical uh, trajectory things follow and doing, I think, I think, something pretty similar to what you're suggesting there. Right. But we didn't do that, so I kind of didn't cover that. But yeah, okay. it, it was a good idea to try that kind of thing. Right. Thanks. Any more? If, uh, well, I've got an observation, actually, because what you were talking about there reminded me so much of learning, um, learning uh, action schema and planning, in fact, and, and some of the stuff there, you can see how maybe you could transform that into maybe a PDDL domain model, and then something, some, some other automaton can come along and actually do the aircraft stuff, <laughs> actually carry out the plans. Well, of course, I mean, I've, I've done this in the terms of uh, video data, but of course it doesn't have to be video data at all. It could be GPS data. In fact, in the aircraft domain, we were supposed to be using GPS data as well, but then the unions got involved and they kind of, and us, because they were worried that we're going to be tracking them and checking, and worried about what they're going to do. So the French unions uh, forbade that. But yeah, I mean, it could be from any kind of you know, sequences of things happening, and you could then like, try to learn uh, you know, models of, of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was some work I did a long time ago with Jerry Kelleher, which kind of published in Ikai, where we were trying to induce domain models from planning operators. Um, and so it's kind of little, that's a little bit similar to that. Um, but that was already at the class level rather than at the instance level. But yeah, I, I think, I mean, I haven't had time yet really to sort of think about it in more detail about how this could be applied to the planning world. But I, th I certainly think, I mean, because it's your modeling actions and activity, yeah. that you know, there has to be some. Yeah, but we have to get them from somewhere rather than having constructing this. OK, any more questions? 
there's commercial software that uh, looks at one of the applications you mentioned, and I, I imagine it does very simple things for sports, right? Tracking uh, the um, distance uh, a player, you know, uh, of a player in a game, the number of passes completed, and so forth. Is it? Is there? Do you know if there are more advanced things that are in such commercial applications, or some things you're thinking about? I mentioned um, sports as a kind of application. We did a tiny bit of work with basketball in this area, but we haven't, I mean, I had that picture of football, but I mean, we haven't really, you know, applied this. Um, I, but we did do some work, because we had there, there's a company called ProZone, which is actually based in Leeds, and they do tracking uh, of all the Premier League uh, clubs in the UK. Uh, initially, they did it all by hand, but then they kind of, using some of our computer vision technology from Leeds to actually help automate that process. Um, I don't believe that they're doing anything more sophisticated to commercially as far as I know, but I'm not an expert in the sort of sports area of activity and so, but I don't believe they're doing anything much more than doing things just like counting the amount of, you know, the total number of time that a particular player is running, how far they run, that those kind of stats. I mean, that's mostly what they're kind of interested in. So they just do object tracking all the I, time? I, I believe so. I don't think they do. But I mean, I'm, I'm not... They may be, but as far as I know, they're not. But uh, I'd be very interested to know if, if there is, uh, you know, more like that. I mean, they, a long time ago, there was, more, there was work on kind of just have commentary describing football games and so forth. There was some work done at um, the FKI and, and there's some of their partners there. Um, and so that work kind of was more like that. And they could then describe the football match at some kind of high level uh, using language and talk, talk about what's happening. So I mean, there has been some work done, but I'm, I'm not quite sure where the present state of the art is on that.